The TA Axe begins its forging journey in the Thornwood Forge Workshop, located in Somerset in the south of England on a beautiful estate surrounded by fields and woodlands. To begin with, Joe needs to cut off a piece of EN9 steel. We chose EN9 for the steel because it's really tough so it can withstand impact, whilst also having the ability to hold a good sharp edge. Once Joe has cut off the piece from the stock, he cleans up the rough edges on the grinder so that it's ready to be forged. So we want the back of the eye to be 20 mil from the pole. So we're just gonna take our ruler and our scribe, line up the end of the ruler with the pole, keep our scribe at 20 mil, take our square and scribe our line across the steel. Then we're gonna take our dividers and use them to make a center line down the middle of the steel. And there we have a cross shape, which shows us where we need to put our center punch mark. We're gonna do that top and bottom, and then we know where to punch a hole. So we're gonna use that cross that we did earlier as a reference mark for our center punch. And uh, UK steel is really annoying because uh, it's not flat. <laughs> so it always rocks about in your anvil. So when you're trying to center punch it or chisel a hole through it, you've uh, got to hold it between some tongs because uh, it rocks about. So we take our center punch, line it up on that cross, give it a good wallop, and there we have our mark. Top and bottom, as before. And the reason we do this is because as the steel gets hot, those scribe lines will disappear and we won't be able to see those. But the center punch marks will stay and we'll be able to see those even when, even when the steel is at a thousand degrees. So we use gas forges. Traditionally, you'd use charcoal or coal or coke forges, but gas is a lot easier to get hold of. Good coke is now getting really hard to find in the UK. Um, but propane is the same quality everywhere and it's really easy to get hold of. Uh, it's also a lot better for your lungs because the coke is really dusty and it releases a lot of sulfur and a lot of gases when you burn it, um, whereas the propane burns really clean. The only danger is carbon monoxide, but we don't really have to worry about that in a barn. So uh, we use it for our health and we use it because it's easy to get good fuel. Also, because we do a lot of production work where we have multiple pieces in the fire at one time, you can leave a gas forge at a consistent temperature and it will stay at about 1000 to 1100 degrees centigrade consistently. Whereas a coke forge will run at 16 to 1800 degrees centigrade, which will burn the steel like that. So if you have multiple pieces in the fire, you can leave one in a gas forge while you're working on the other. So you can have one heating up while you're working on the other one. And it's just a lot more smooth when you're trying to do batches of product. This is a really nice gas forge, Swan Porter Forge, um, but only nerds will want to know that. Really. <laughs> Originally designed for farriers. Oh really? Yeah, so you can stick them in the back of a van. Oh. It doesn't require electricity or anything like that. And yeah, really good bits of kit. Lighting it's really easy. We just turn the handle. Ninety percent of the time, we work steel at about a thousand degrees. So when we put it in the fire, we let it heat up until it's a really nice bright yellow colour. Temperatures are all well and good, but in practice, it's a lot easier just to look at the colour of the steel rather than getting out a thermometer and trying to work it out exactly. So we pop it in the fire, heat it up to a nice bright yellow, and then we pull it out, work it, do whatever we're doing to it, change its shape, forge it, drift it, whatever, until it gets to a nice dull red colour. This kind of depends on the steel. Often high carbon steels have a narrower forging range than mild steel. But generally speaking, we'll forge it until it's a dull red, then pop it back in the fire. So we can work it between about 1,850 degrees before we have to then heat it up again. If you try and forge steel colder than that, it will work harder. So as you work it, as you hit it, uh, the steel will get harder and it will eventually split and fracture. If you work it hotter, it will burn. So it will um, just overheat. It'll look like a sparkler uh, and you'll ruin your piece of material. The steel we're using for these axes is EN9. The name doesn't really mean anything. It's just a, a code of reference, but it's a medium carbon steel between 0.5 and 0.6% carbon that will get it to about 55 Rockwell. 
um, which is really good for axes, it's not too hard, but the main advantage of using this seal is that it's really tough. So once this steel is heat treated, it can withstand a beating and uh, it really won't. It will just shrug it off. To open up an axe block, it's really important that we turn it every strike or every few strikes. Because when I made this, it's very unlikely that I ground it perfectly symmetrical. So as you drive it through, it would like to drive off in one direction or the other. If we keep turning it, it will keep it even and driving straight through the block rather than trying to go off in one way or the other. This is called a drift and this is a tool we use to shape the inside of the eye of the axe. Its cross section is a teardrop shape, which is how we want the finished eye to look. And we basically drive it through the block and hammer around the outside to create that shape. The last thing I'm going to do now is go in with the chisel and open up the hole enough that I can get this drift in. And after that, we'll be working on the drift to work the eye to its final shape. What's going to happen now is I'm going to be using the drift on the swage block. And the swage block is an anvil uh, that is much more versatile basically. So most anvils are just a large flat face. The swage block has got many different sizes of shapes uh, cut into it in holes or on the sides you've got these scoops or you've got triangular cutouts. So it's really, really versatile. Basically everything here is an anvil. That's an anvil. That's an anvil with lots of different holes in. And a vice is an anvil that holds things. <laughs> That's basically how it works. I'm going to use the swage block because it will support the axe. As I drive the drift through, it will support all the way around the eye, but leave a hole for the drift to come through. First couple of heats, I'm just going to be going in with the drift uh, just to get the shape of the eye the same as the drift rather than the same as the punch. And then once I've been in from both sides, I'm going to start using the power hammer to draw out the cheeks. The cheeks come down the handle and provide extra support for the head. There's more surface contact between the axe head and the handle. Uh, and this pattern of axe has pointed cheeks, but to start with, we're just going to make them rounded and then start to shape them a little bit later on. So at this stage, I, want, I need to work out what's top and what's bottom. The next thing we're going to do is we're going to start drawing down the cheeks of the axe. Uh, and these provide extra surface area on the handle so the head is more secure. I'm going to be doing this on the power hammer. This is a 15 kilo Anyang, so it's a really baby power hammer, but it still has a fair old whack. I'm using these really aggressive dies, and what that's going to do is draw the steel down in a very specific direction. So it won't push it sideways, it will just push it down in the direction that we want. We'll have to make them pointy on the anvil later on, but for now we just want to start moving that material downwards. Great, so after the first heat, what we have is our eyes look in better shape. We started drawing these cheeks down. But it's also spread out towards the top a little bit. So the next thing I'm gonna do is just flatten out that top again, because I don't want those coming up. A lot of people just grind it off, so they'll spread it out in both directions and just grind off the top. But I kind of think that's cheating. So next thing I'm gonna do is forge that top flat again. I'm going to go from the top a couple of times, but then I don't really want to go much further, to be honest. The pole has a great amount of width. It's exactly what we're looking for. We're looking for this width, and it's got over that, which is perfect because it will get smaller as we go. The cheeks are really nice height. Again, they'll shrink a little bit as we go through the process. So we're kind of in a really good position. We've just got to open out the top a little bit. This is called Smith & Striker. It's a very basic version of Smith & Striker where you have the Smith who's working on the project and you have the Striker who's kind enough to lend his time to come over and lend a hand. And in this case, what Jimmy's going to be doing is striking onto a top tool with a sledgehammer. So this is called a filler. 
Uh, it's quite an aggressive shape that will dig into the steel and leave us a little um, hollow. And this is what's going to separate handle from blade. Uh, we can see this in the axe, in the finished axe. It's this area here. That's what we're going to be working on. And this pushes that blade material forwards and then will allow us to come in here and shape our cheeks. Jimmy's going to strike every time I say yes, and the louder I say yes, the harder he hits, basically. So we're going to go gentle to start with to make sure we're in the right place. Yep. 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 One. Where we've been fullering in, it's spread out on the sides, so I'm just going to knock that back in. Then we're going to go again. Yup. 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 You can see that there. Yup. Yup. Going to come back in and start to shape the cheeks a little bit. Uh, because now I can get to the bottom of where the, those cheeks are disappearing into that fuller. So I'm going to use that space and just start forging in a bit of shape into those cheeks. And then we'll come back and start spreading out the blade. So when we were discussing the design for this axe and deciding what we wanted to do and mainly Mike's requirements, um, we wanted to do a fusion really between English style and Scandinavian. So the, the back of the axe is very much English. We've got very classically English cheeks and a large pole. But then we've gone really Scandinavian for the bit of the axe and we've got this really nice beard on here which gives you this longer cutting edge and more longevity in the axe as you sharpen it back. Um, but to create this beard is quite difficult. If you imagine what we've got now is a block like this and we've got to spread that downwards and forwards. Going forwards is easy, going downwards is difficult and where we don't want it to go is up. And that's exactly where the steel wants to go. It wants to go up more than anywhere else. So the challenge here is to keep it down so we can get all that material down here at the bottom of the bit so we still have a good amount of thickness at the bottom of the beard. If it tapers aggressively from top to bottom, that's no good to anyone. Yep. We're getting to a point now where the blade is around 70-80%. So I'm just going to go back to working on the eye a little bit. Because at the moment, most of the material we need to get the length is in the eye. Um, Mike's come and joined us again and we're picking up where we left off. So where we got to last time was we got the profile forged. Um, this is as it is off the forge. Um, we've gone through, put our fullers in, the eye is to its final shape. We've got the cheeks to a nice depth and a nice thickness, not too thin. We've got a nice even edge thickness and a nice profile on top. Not perfectly straight at this point, but we can sort that out later on. The next thing we need to do is profile grind it. So we're just going to run our, the grinder along all the edges, crisp everything up. It, we don't take off a lot of steel, um, but it just sharpens everything up and makes all the lines really nice and clean. What we've just done is go over with a really coarse 36 grit. And that's got us our profile. Got in with a small wheel attachment just to clean that up in there. 
What I'm going to do now is put a finer belt on, so a 220 grit, and we're going to go over the whole thing and just clean up these lines because these grind lines are really coarse. So we clean that up, smooth it off a little bit, and then just knock the corners off so there's no sharp edges. If we're using these belts, yeah. um, it's kind of one every 10 blades. Oh wow, really, quite often. Though. And then with these ones, it would be one every blade. Really? But then recently I started using these ones, bought them as a bit of an experiment. They're twice the price, but we can grind 60 blades oh, wow. with one of them. Instead of one per blade. Yeah. And these ones, which are kind of finishing belts, you can use them for a long time. Belts are probably my biggest expense. Yeah, imagine. Because they're yeah. super expensive. One of, one of these is 15 something pounds, and that's with a 20% discount. Really? Yeah, with it, that's with a discount, so. And these are 10 or each. Crikey, yeah, that's a big expense. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. So that's, what I'd really like is to be sponsored by 3M. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm not that famous yet. <laughs> Cool. Whack that speed up. All sorted now, all the sides are up to a nice 220 grit, so when we put this back in the forge and run along all the edges, those grind lines will disappear, which is exactly what we want. You can see the profile's not too dissimilar to how it was before we started grinding, but it looks a lot more neat now. It kind of crisps everything up, makes it look a lot more tidy. Now we just need to break the corners, make sure it's nice and straight, and put our touch marks in it. So it's one pound four ounces, or 640 grams. It will be a little bit lighter by the time we finished, once we've ground in our bevel. But that's a really nice weight. So the last stage of the forging process is what we call breaking the corners. And this is where we finalize everything, make sure it's all nice and tidy. And this is our last chance to make any final tweaks we want to. So the axe is just warming up. What we're gonna do, we're gonna take a nice light hammer and just run it along all the edges, putting a little chamfer. It's those little details that really make the difference. Then we're going to put the drift in, make sure the eye is the right size and shape, and we're happy with it, and then we're gonna put the touch mark in. The final thing we do is straighten the axe, make sure it's dead straight, hasn't got any twists or bends, and then it goes into the vermiculite to anneal. The other reason we do this is that when we put the chamfer on, it upsets the edges of the steel a little bit. So we're just knocking it down so we've got flat surfaces again, rather than a little scoop in the middle. Cool, so now we're gonna go in with the drift, open up the eye again, because putting those chamfers on has closed it down a bit. Pop our stamp in and then make sure everything is nice and straight. First thing I'm going to do is check that the blade is straight and in line with the drift, which is not. So we'll just straighten that up first. Lovely job. Check the blade is straight in itself. Nice and gentle. Check it straight, which it is. I'm gonna use the vise now, it's going from the top. So before we do the final straightening, the last thing we need to do is put the touch mark in. You can see we've got our eye to a nice shape, 
top and bottom. It's the right size. Traditionally, the touch mark is not only a mark to tell you who made it, but it's also a mark of quality. You don't put your touch mark in anything you're not happy with, because then everybody knows exactly who made it. <laughs> nice. So this is a quick and dirty version of annealing, which is essentially softening the steel. Uh, it's relaxing it. When you forge steel, it puts a lot of stress into the steel. So we want to make sure that's all dissipated before we do any further heat treating. So here we're just going to let it cool down with the forge. It'll take maybe half an hour to an hour, depending on when we put it out. And uh, that way there'll be no tension left over in the steel when we go to harden it. So we're going to move on to the exciting bit of the heat treating process, which is the hardening. And this is where an axe shaped piece of steel really becomes an axe. Um, because you kind of give it its heart and soul, really. At the moment, it's really soft, so if you put an edge on it, it would get sharp, but that edge wouldn't last. So as soon as you try to use it, it would dull, um, and you'd have to keep sharpening it over and over. So what we're going to be doing is a ferrous metal, because it's steel. We're going to heat it up to what's called a critical temperature, and then cool it down very quickly. If you cool it down too fast, you'll put too much stress into the steel and it will either warp or crack. And if you cool it down too slowly, it won't harden. So there's a fine balance. Our quenching substrate today is just vegetable oil. It has a relatively high flash point so you don't burn your hand and uh, it's really easy to get hold of, which is kind of uh, the main thing for me. So what we're going to do, we're going to heat the axe up to a critical temperature which is around 820 degrees for this steel and then we're going to cool it down very quickly in the oil. What we're looking for is a really nice even heat across the whole axe. So we're going to get the whole thing to a nice um, dull orange colour really. It's nice we've got the lights off, the darker the environment the easier it is to see the true temperature of the steel. So what we're doing is we're changing the molecular structure of the steel. You can think of it as a series of iron cubes and on the boundaries between two cubes you've got carbon molecules. When you heat the steel up, those carbon molecules migrate into the cube structures of the iron. If it cools down slowly, that carbon migrates back to the molecular boundaries and it's soft again. If you cool it down quickly, the carbon is trapped inside the cube structures of the iron and that's what creates a hard steel. Obviously, normally we would do all the heat treating in the kiln, which is digitally controlled, so it heats up at a very specific rate to a very specific temperature. Because of time constraints today, we're going to do it in the forge. This is the way it would have been done many, many years ago. Right from when axes were first came on the scene, if you like, um, they would have just been heat treated in the forge. You can, it's still really controllable. This is a gas forge, not a coal forge, um, but it's still really controllable and you can get a nice even heat. The only thing we have to be careful of is that the thin areas, like the tips of the cheeks, don't heat up before the rest of the axe. So you'll see me taking it in and out, in and out, and that's just so the thin areas don't get too hot before the rest of it has got up to temperature. There's a really neat trick you can do. Uh, if you have a magnet, when the steel is just below its critical temperature, it will become non-magnetic, which is really confusing when the first time you see it, but it's also really cool. You can touch a magnet to it, and it won't stick at all. The hardest areas to heat up are the pole at the back of the axe and the area just in front of the eye. Those are the two thickest places, and so take the longest to warm up. So I'm being really careful just to get the heat into those without overheating the cheeks before I spin it round and start getting the heat into the blade. So we've got a nice even heat there. So we'll go for the quench.
Nice. So we add a bit of decarb on the edge, which is normal when you're using a gas forge. And then you just hear how it sounds like you're filing glass. And that file just skates off without cutting the steel, which says that this steel is harder than the file. I'm gonna do an old fashioned temper on this. So what we're doing now is tempering the ax. So when you harden something, uh, it becomes very brittle as well. And you, especially with an impact tool like an ax, you need to temper that hardness with toughness. Toughness is its ability to withstand force. So we're going to do that by heating from the back and letting that heat bleed through towards the edge. This is called a differential temper. So the back, the pole of the ax and the eye will be softer than the bit. And that's exactly what we want. The back can be struck with a piece of wood or you can use it to bash in temp pegs, that sort of thing, without damaging the ax at all because it's nice and springy. But the edge still retains a little bit more hardness to keep that sharp edge. So I'm just going to use the residual heat from the forge and start heating up the back of the ax. The useful thing about the oil we use is it starts to smoke around 200 degrees, which is exactly the temperature we want to temper the axe at. So when the oil left over on the steel starts to smoke, we know we're getting in the right ballpark. So I'm just keeping an eye on this. I'm looking for a blue color around the pole and the eye, and then looking for a golden straw color along the edge. I've cleaned up a little bit of the edge with the grinder, just so I can see that color bleeding through. So you can see it, see it starting to smoke, so we're getting to that 200 degree area. Like I say, this is the old fashioned way to do it, if you like. Um, we've got the kiln over there, which is really useful when you're doing batches. You can heat, heat treat 10 axes at a time rather than doing them individually like so. I'm just watching the color in the edge. It's going gold, it's going very gold because there's a lot of oil on it. But just looking at that color there, looking at the clean steel where it doesn't have any oil on it. And I'm just gonna quench it in water. So this temperature, it doesn't matter that you quench it in water. That's fine. Um, but we just want to stop that heat going any further. There it is. So all that's left is we'll run it over on the wire wheel, the wheel of death, uh, and then we'll bevel grind it. So what this will do is it will just clean up the surface, get rid of any loose scale, and it will leave us in a really nice place to grind those bevels. Those sparks coming off are the loose scale from the steel, um, heating up with the friction from the wheel and coming off. That's how a sparkler works. Burns small pieces of iron or steel. And so what we're looking for with an ax is a convex grind. So the more material you have behind a cutting edge, the stronger that edge will be, because it's supported by more material. So a hollow grind, where the grind comes in like this, is very, very sharp, but also very weak. So it's used for things where you need a lot of sharpness, but not a lot of toughness, like straight razors. On the opposite end of the scale, you've got something like an ax, which you still want to be really sharp, but it doesn't have to be like a razor, so to speak. More importantly, it needs to be really tough and put up with a lot of stress. And so we're going for a convex edge. And that way you have a lot of material behind your edge to support it so that in use it doesn't get um, worn away too quickly. Here what we have is this top wheel here, and then we have this slack underneath. And you can see how that belt, when you push on it, bends in and by the amount of tension you put on the belt it can bend in more or less. What I'm going to do is I'm going to hold the axe between my index finger and thumb and my second hand is going to go behind to support it. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to use the wheel 
to get the grind higher and then use the slack belt, you can see pushing into the belt there, to get that convex. So it's gonna be rocking the axe backwards and forwards over the wheel, then the slack belt, wheel, slack belt, wheel, slack belt, until we have ourselves a nice bevel. I'm gonna rough it in on a 36 grit belt and remove as much material as I can, go down to about a one millimeter thick edge. Then I'm gonna to go to a finer belt, probably 80 grit, then 180, 220, 400, and then we'll use one of the surface conditioning belts. And that will give us a really nice finish on the bevel. And it will also mean when we then finish it on the buffing wheel, we'll have a really nice sharp edge. Uh, it doesn't really change the shape at all, doesn't change the geometry at all. It leaves a nice surface finish and just refines that burr a little bit. And there we have the finished bevel. The last stage is to just polish this burr on the buffing wheel. There we have it, nice and clean. A few smears on there, but really nice and sharp. Easily shaving sharp. There's the finished axe head. So from here, the next stage is to take the finished axe head and put a handle on it. So we've got some ash from Mike's Woodland and we start with these big square beams of wood, cut them down, shape the handles, fit them to axe, the axe head individually um, and then they're ready for their sheaths. So now 1.3 pounds. 600 grams, almost exactly, 601 grams. Makes me want to go and shave one gram yeah. off. <laughs> 600 gram head, that's really nice.